Some time ago here in Great Britain, a man was found guilty of criminal negligence. He had seen an automobile accident in which several people were critically hurt and had left the scene without offering a helping hand. He was given a stiff sentence because he had left undone something he should have done. Scores of people are convicted every year on both sides of the Atlantic for failing to do their duty. An American officer was court-martialed recently because he neglected to do something he should have done. The Bible teaches that possibly the greatest sins that can be committed are those of omission. Today I want to speak on the subject, the sin of negative living. Nothing would please Satan more than for Christians to fall into a rut of negation. We have hundreds of Christians on both sides of the Atlantic who are continually talking about the things they do not do. Some say, I do not dance, I do not drink, I do not gamble. And they think that because they do not do these particular things that they have a peculiar type of righteousness. They become almost like the Pharisees of old. The world is not half so impressed by the evil things you do not do as they are by the good you do. Certainly you should not do these things, but there are thousands of people who glory in the fact that they do not do certain things, while they commit even more grievous sins by leaving undone things they should have been doing all the time. They are guilty of the sin of negative living. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great London preacher, was once the guest of a man who made his virtues the chief topic of conversation. But his virtues were all of the negative kind, consisting of the bad things he had not done. Disgusted with the man's self-righteousness, Spurgeon said, Why, man, you're simply a bundle of negatives. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't gamble, you don't swear. What in the name of goodness do you do? The world is not particularly attracted by negative living. I once heard an old, rheumatic, twisted, elderly lady get up in a testimony meeting years ago and say, Thank God I don't dance. The young people present with their youthful imagination visualize that dear old lady trying to jitterbug and burst out laughing. Her testimony, well meant, fell by the wayside. I know that fundamentally salvation is not of works, but in stressing this phase of the gospel, too many have neglected to emphasize the fact that we will be judged more by the good we have left undone than the evil we have done. Good works are not a means of salvation because we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved only on the grounds of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But our good works are an evidence of salvation. And if we fail to do all the good we can to all the people we can at any time we can, by any means we can, we will be condemned at the judgment bar of God. Make no mistake about that. Jesus gave a clear, strong warning against the blighting, murderous sin of omission. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. He called those who failed to do good as unto him cursed. He called those who did good as unto him righteous. It is a very significant thing that in every one of Jesus' parables of condemnation, the sin condemned is the sin of omission. I did not discover this until recently, and in my Bible reading and Bible study, when I found this point out, it hit me as a thunderbolt. The very fact that not one place in all the parables of Jesus, the parables of condemnation, was the sin, the sin that they had done. It was rather the sin of omission. For example, the guest at the wedding supper was cast out because he did not have on the wedding garment. The five foolish virgins did not bring oil in their vessels with their lamps. The man with one talent did not trade with it to his master's profit. Dives the rich man did not minister to the poor man Lazarus lying at his gate. The unmerciful servant did not forgive the fellow servant who owed him a paltry hundred pence. And in the parable of the last judgment, those on the left hand were cast into outer darkness not because they had committed some grave evil, but because they had failed to do good when the opportunity presented itself. The truest sacrament 
is not mere creeds, nor ordinances, nor pious or forms, but a life of service to God and to man. The most eloquent prayer is prayed through hands that heal and bless. The highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and helpless. In the parable of the Last Judgment, the people were not asked questions of theology. As important as doctrine is, they were not asked about their doctrinal beliefs, neither would they ask what sins they'd left off doing. Theirs was chiefly and solely the neglect to do good, and their sin was grave enough to send them into everlasting punishment. There must be a practical outworking of our faith here in this present world, or it will never endure in the world to come. We need fewer words and more charitable works. We need less palaver and more pity, less creed and more compassion. The Pharisees majored on shibboleth, but minored on service. And Jesus said, except your righteousness exceeds their righteousness, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. In the city of Strasbourg, Germany, there's a church that was bombed during the war. It was totally destroyed, but a statue of Christ which stood by the altar was almost unharmed. Only the hands of the statue were missing. The people of that church rebuilt their sanctuary, and a famous sculptor offered to make new hands to attach to the arms of the statue by the altar. But after considering the matter, they decided to let it stand as it was without hands. For, they said, Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work on earth. If we don't feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, entertain the stranger, visit the imprisoned and close the naked, who will? Christ is depending on us to do the very things which he did while upon earth. But many of us have failed him. We've gone our own selfish, careless way, heedless of the cry of the needy. My friends, if the gospel we preach does not have a social application, if it will not work effectively in the workaday world, then it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a man in your community who has done you an injustice. Feelings have mounted between you and everyone knows the way you feel about him. You could extend to him the warm hand of forgiveness, but willfully you refuse to do so. That is your sin. Jesus laid down a very clear rule for this sort of situation. He said, therefore, if thou bringest thy gift to the altar and rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way and then come and offer thy gift. Christ our Lord set this example of forgiveness before us. He was maligned, blasphemed, falsely accused, and without cause crucified, but he freely forgave those who wronged him. Amidst unthinkable suffering, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He who had the grace to forgive can give you the grace to forgive your enemy. Remember that. You know a man who has had misfortune and bereavement in your community. His burden has been almost greater than he can bear. You have thought that you should visit him and offer him a helping hand, even some financial help, but you've neglected to do it. That is your sin. Christ has been holding out his hand of compassion, saying, Inasmuch as ye do it unto the least of these, ye do it unto me. But you have turned a deaf ear to him. You have gone on your selfish way one step nearer judgment. You know a young man in your community with the red blood of youth coursing down his veins. You have known the battle he is fighting against temptation. He is discouraged and beginning to lose heart. It would be so easy for you to lay your hand on his shoulder and give him a word of encouragement and cheer, but you haven't done it. That is your sin. The Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. You know a mother who for days has been standing over the fevered body of a sick child. Night and day she has kept her weary vigil, and now she is utterly worn out and her nerves are taut. It occurred to you to visit her and relieve her for one night, but you didn't do it. You went on your own selfish way. This is your sin. Christ expected you to relieve that weary woman in his stead, but you refused. Such selfishness is sin, and a sin we hear too little about today. You know a poor family down the street, and you have heard that the father is out of work and that they have scarcely a thing in the house to eat. You've intended to visit that family and ask if they would accept some food from you, but you've procrastinated and failed to do it. That is your sin. Oh yes, I know that according to the law it is not a sin, but in the eyes of God it is as grave as any evil. These ought ye to have done and not to have left the other undone, said Jesus. For failing to do these acts of Christian kindness, a serious judgment awaits you. You know a man in your neighborhood that needs Christ, but you have not spoken to him about Christ. You have not tried to win him to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You know another person in your community that needs a ride to Sunday school. They're not able to go to Sunday school and church because they have no way, and yet you haven't offered to help them. That is your sin. 
God gave his only son to help the condition of mankind. What have you done? Will the judge of the universe furrow his brow and condemn you as he did the Pharisees when he said, Woe unto you, for ye have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Must you commit some great sin to lose the worthwhile things of life? No, indeed not. Many a home has been wrecked not because the husband or wife committed any great sin, but simply because they neglected to do the good things which keep marriage and love alive. Many a business has failed not because the owner was dishonest or had done great wrong, but because he just failed to perform the little kind gestures that bring in customers. His was the fatal mistake of omission. Many a man has lost his health. Not because he abused his body with immoral practices or injured it by filthy habits, but simply because he was indifferent toward his physical welfare. He neglected his health. His was the sin of omission, the evil of sheer neglect. Many a person is shriveled in his soul and has drawn the dark shades of selfishness around him and sits on the brink of spiritual death, all because he has passed every God-given opportunity to do good. Now, because those golden hours are past and he is craven in his soul, the light is gone out of his life. The dusk of eternity's night has already begun to settle down upon him. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Oh yes, God hears the cry of the starving millions in Asia. He hears the wail of the millions of untouchables in India. He sees the misery of the millions of underprivileged in Africa. He knows the suffering of the sad, the distressed, and the bereaved around the world. Their cry has come up before him and pointing to us, he says, I've given you wealth. Have you divided it? I've given you love. Have you shared it? I've given you an abundance. Have you given a little? And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of the least of these a cup of cold water only, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Unless our belief in God helps us to help our fellow man, our faith stands condemned. Our love for God is best proved by a regard for the needs of our neighbors. Man is God's crowning creation. God regarded him highly enough to give his only son for his redemption. We cannot be oblivious of our neighbor's needs and expect the continued favor of the Almighty. The cross represents the eye crossed out. The Christian life, if it is to be worthy of the name, is the life of selflessness. Self is crucified. The eye is crossed out. Jesus, our Lord, said, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Lord, help me to live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. That was the way Jesus looked at it, kneeling in Gethsemane's garden with blood coming from his veins and from the pores of his skin and the agony that he was enduring. He said, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Jesus was ready to go to the cross and die for others, for you, for me. And now Jesus says, all of you that have received me, all of you that claim to me my followers, all of you that claim to love me, go out and share it with others. That also means carrying the gospel to them. Not only a cup of cold water, but telling those round about you that Jesus died for them, that he can forgive them and give them peace and joy and happiness and take them to heaven when they die and forgive all of their sins. That is what has been entrusted to us. We have been entrusted with this treasure now let's go share it. That is the reason that we go day and night on our team from one country to another by radio, by film, by newspaper, in every way we possibly can, trying to share with others the gospel of Jesus Christ. You too need to learn to share. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that we shall not be guilty of this terrible sin of omission, the sin that has condemned so many millions in the past. We pray that these sins that we are committing day by day, that sometimes we do not even count as sin, will be brought by the Holy Spirit to our remembrance, that we will confess them and renounce them and follow and serve Christ in selflessness. For we ask it in His name. Amen.